Hello there, students. Today we're going to be talking about definitions, variable bindings, and the environment. All programming languages that anyone really uses have some notion of a variable binding that assigns a identifier to some value in the programming language. Today we're going to introduce a few of the core ideas surrounding how variables are represented in programming languages, and we're going to define some key terms that will apply across languages. One of the most important among these is the notion of an environment, which defines the set of variables in scope at any given syntactic point within the program. Most programming languages implicitly give us access to some global environment. For example, we might call this the prelude, which gives us a bunch of definitions and a starting environment that include definitions for things like plus, minus, all those other sorts of what we might think of as built-in operators. Now, Racket actually takes this one step further. It also gives us bindings for macros. We're not going to talk too much about macros for now, so we're going to give an account of environments that looks a lot like it would in other languages like standard ML, Haskell, or JavaScript, something like that. So while they're an important part macros, we're going to focus largely on the orthogonal components that are kind of uh, present in most different programming languages. All right, so let's dig into it. All right. So there are two main forms that we use to add things to the environment in Racket. And these are both the de define forms. Define comes in two variants. The first allows us to define variable bindings. So if I define ID to be expert, I'm saying bind the identifier ID to the value of expert. The second form allows me to define functions with a certain number of arguments, all named and then usable from the body. Although Racket allows multiple bodies for functions definitions, often we use just one, and the return or the evaluation of the last body will be the evaluation of the entire function. This supports functions being able to have side effects, which is something that we're not really going to talk too much about in the early parts of the course, but it'll become apparent later on. So now we get to two exercises. These should both be reviews from last week. The first asks us to define a variable named x to be the value 42. And the second asks us to define a function named foo, which is the identity function. So let's redefine x to be 42. Once I've defined it up here in the file, when I click run, I can go into the REPL and I can see everything in the environment that gets exported from this piece of code up here. So now I can click X or I can type X and I'll get 42 back. Similarly, I can define an identity function foo of X. When I run this piece of code, anything that I put in will come right back out on the other side. The environment is always precise to a point in the program. There's not just one unique environment, although this is something that students are very eager to do because we have terms like the global environment. So global variables in most programming languages are one top level environment, but often it's very cluttered. We want to be very careful to make sure that we always are respecting the fact that we know when uh, variables will be defined. So, we can see right here, at this point in the program, x is defined to be 23. So when we perform x plus 1, we'll get the result 24. However, there's no definition for y at this point in the program. And so if I tried to use the variable y right here, I would run into a problem. Let's just copy and paste this into Racket. All right, so if I try to use this result right here, I'll see an error. It'll say, y is undefined. I can't reference an identifier before its definition. All right, and that's because there are two separate environments for the two different parts of the program, the two different lines of the program that I end up on. The upshot of this is that environments are specific to an individual point, and the environment will not be the same at every point in the program, which is going to be very important as we learn later. Now another interesting property of environments is that environments nest. 
At the top of the program, I have some top-level environment, or the global environment, the default environment I start with. I can add definitions inside of functions, and I can add internal defines. And those scope to the function, but they do not escape the function. This relates to a concept named lexical scope, which is a concept we'll cover relatively shortly in class. So let's look at this piece of code right here. Right here I've defined a binding for y, which appears in the top-level environment for the program. If I try to reference y right here, I'll just get the value 5. Inside this function foo, I display ln y. This instance of y refers to this binding right here. However, I redefine y right here and then compute its value. So the result of foo overall is the value y even though this value y right here refers to this definition. This is essentially lexical scope, although we don't have quite what we need yet to talk about it, so we'll make that formal a little bit later in the class. Thus, this call to foo returns the value 4 from this definition right here, rather than the value for y given right here. And that's a very important thing to realize. However, even though we defined y right here, this definition of y doesn't escape in the sense that when I'm looking at this variable definition y, it's actually this version. And as we can see, the whole time that I've been doing this, Dr. Racket has been highlighting over the expressions to show me their uses. This is something you might want to do as a student if you're confused about how those bindings work. All right, so now let's ask ourselves a little bit of trivia. What does the following function return? All right, so we've got a function foo. Inside of foo, we're going to define plus to be 1. It looks a little bit silly, but there's nothing that stops us from redefining even the word plus or the, the, uh, the identifier plus to be the value 1. There's nothing special about the built-in plus. It's just an identifier that happens to point at the implementation of Racket's underlying definition for plus. Now right here, we've said that divide is going to be set to 2 times plus. So really that's times 2, 1, because plus has been defined to be 1. Now times still has its normal definition, so it's going to do the normal definition of multiplication, which is just going to result in 2. And thus, divide is going to be equal to 2. So then here, we're going to say minus plus, which is 1, and then divide, which is 2. And that's going to give us the result negative 1. Now when I run this function foo, I get the result negative 1 back. And one of the important things to realize here, and this is something I'll reiterate a whole bunch because it's one of my most favorite things about Racket, is that built-in functions like plus, things that would be operators in C and C++, are not special. And in fact, you can redefine their names. However, it would be a very bad idea to do so in normal code. And I can't think of any time when I've legitimately done that in code other than the kinds of things I wrote right now to sort of give these sort of brain teasers to students as they learn languages. Now, as we said last time, definitions with the word define are actually not expressions in the sense that they do not generate values, right? So a define form does not generate a value. It just adds a binding to the environment. So it's kind of a special thing. There's an analog of defined named let. Let is an expression. It has the following form. We have let, and then we have open parentheses, open bracket, and we have the variable name that we want to bind, and then the, val, uh, the expression e that we want to bind it to, and then we have some e body. What this is going to do is it's going to evaluate e body in an environment where var has been set to the evaluation of e. So the first thing we're going to do, for example, in this code right here, is we're going to evaluate 2, which just evaluates to the number 2, then bind that to x, 
I'm then going to perform the body here. So here, this binding of X refers to this definition right here. Let's look at this in Dr. Racket. So if I run this one, I get five out. I could define this to be whatever I want. It doesn't, uh, it can be any other expression. So it can be, for example, plus one, three. And notice that even if X has another value in this top level scope, this value of X will shadow the definition right here. This is called shadowing. Whenever we redefine a variable definition or whenever we rebind a variable definition, we're going to sometimes shadow a previous definition. So within this, the scope of this S expression or this let body right here, the body of the let, we're going to have this identifier for X rather than this one. Let's say we change this to Y we change this to y, well now this will point at this binding right here because it will no longer be shadowed. All right, similarly we can have more than one variable. So in this piece of code right here I define x to be 2 and I define y to be 3 and then I say x plus y in the body and that'll give me the result 5. Now one thing that I can't do with let, which is a little bit counterintuitive, and students often run into this problem, is that it doesn't allow simul uh, simultaneous bindings to see each other. So I often think of this as parallel let. So for example, I can see right here, I can define let x to be 2 and then let y to be x. Well, I'm not allowed to do this because the let form alone doesn't let any of the subsequent simultaneous bindings see any of the other ones. I think of them as all being assigned, for example, in parallel. You can imagine when you get to the let, you go off and you compute all of the different branches in parallel, and then you join back up before you enter the body of the let. That's kind of how I think about it. Now there's also a form named let star. This is something you should learn about because it'll become very helpful later. Let star lets us define a sequence of variables. I often refer to this as sequential let because I'm doing a few different lets in a row. So previously in our last example, we were not allowed to use the binding for x in the subsequent definition of y. But if we use let star because it's sequential let, I can think of first defining x and then I can think of defining y. Now let me ask you, if you didn't have let star, would you be able to still get this same behavior? Well, it turns out you can. All you have to do is you have to use let creatively. So how can I rewrite the above using just let? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and factor out each definition into a separate let statement. So now, because the body of this top level let then becomes another let, I can now bind x being in scope referring to this top level binding, since this is now the body of this let right here. So in general, whenever I have a let star, of n variables being defined, I can always expand that out to an in-depth let. And this is just an example of how you could imagine this expanding. This, this really is basically how let star is defined in Racket. All right, so that's pretty much this lecture.